so this question was a little bit longer um, and and I, I really understand the the issue going on here so basically this was what about this all this stuff with you have implicit memory and explicit memory and declarative and semantic and I, I guess I understand all the separate parts but um, are these different memories well what an excellent question so here's what I thought we would do I realized that the person asking the question said, I understand all the parts of memory, but I don't think it's bad to do a review here. So let's let's try and split this up. Okay, so we start off with memory. Now, memory is complicated enough as it is, but you can split that up into two kinds of memory. Okay, so on the one hand, we have explicit memory and what makes things confusing is that this is also known as declarative memory it would be really great if there would be one name for all of these things because this sometimes confuses people but then you also have implicit memory and implicit memory is also known as non-declarative non-declarative memory now within these you could make um, further distinctions you can make yet another distinction prospective and retrospective memory prospective memory is memory for something you have to do in the future like in 20 minutes I have to turn off the stove and then there is retrospective memory, which is, which is the type of memory we typically talk about when we mean memory. Something like, oh, I, uh, a month ago I turned 35 years old, something like this, this kind of stuff, right? So you remember something from the past. But that's not what I'm talking about now. now. I'm talking about explicit memory and implicit memory. So let's see what we have. Well, declarative memory, explicit memory can be split up into two further things, okay? On the one hand, we have episodic memory. And episodic memory is memory for specific things from your life. Uh, the standard example, your first kiss. You remember that because it left an impression. It's an important autobiographical memory. And different distinctions have been made in this, like episodic memory, autobiographical memory, etc. But let's not get into that for, for this course. Episodic memory, your autobiography. But then you also have semantic memory. And semantic memory, if episodic memory is your autobiography, then semantic memory is an encyclopedia. You know that the capital of France is Paris. You know this, right? That would be semantic memory. Now what I would like to do, before we get into implicit memory, is try and link this immediately on the spot to the brain. Because I think that may help you to, to remember uh, these things a bit better. So for episodic memory, what do I know about the brain? We know that there is cortical storage. And um, we also know that the hippocampus is involved. Uh, so, <clears throat> and you know, different areas around the hippocampus like, like we have talked about in class. But so if I take out a brain, right? I take out a brain, let me, let me zoom out a little bit here. I take out a brain, okay? So where is episodic memory? Yeah, well, we know that there was a patient called KC who had extensive damage in his, uh, like, there was damage in his hippocampus and he could not remember things from his life. So that the hippocampus is involved, that's one thing, but we'll, we'll get to the hippocampus. Where in his brain? Well, I can't point it out to you exactly because I don't have access to, to his, um, uh, his, 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 his CAT scans and such. Uh, but we know that there was frontoparietal damage. Well, you know that this is the frontal lobe, and you know that this is 
let me see this is the parietal lobe so we know that there is something going on there there was uh, occipital parietal there was some damage so it was, it was quite extensive so in other words quite a lot of areas are involved cortically for episodic memory so it seems but then of course when I open up this brain here right now you're looking at this transversal section right so where's the hippocampus well if I take out the corpus callosum this green thing here yeah that's kind of hippocampus so if I if I just put that there and I take another model that's the hippocampus so you're looking at the top of the fornix here right that's this so there you go there are your hippocampi right with the dentate gyrus inside and the fimbria of the hippocampus and the uh, fornix so this area is probably involved in episodic memory as well and as you can see that is indeed kind of in there right like in the uh, medial temporal lobe okay but then there also was semantic memory the memory for facts this is the memory that so this was patient KC who had damage in these areas who no longer had episodic memory but he seemed to have okay semantic memory now we have patient HM right and patient HM uh, had semantic memory issues he could no longer store new facts so this too has cortical storage and this too has the hippocampus involved that's strange hippocampus is involved in both episodic and semantic memory yeah that brings us to the issue of are these actually separate memory processes well that's a good question and that's something we can come back to but let's first talk just a little bit about implicit memory so what do we have an implicit memory right well in implicit memory we have a couple of things we have skill learning and you may remember that HM even though he had trouble with factual stuff remembering new facts he could learn new motor skills so if you think of something like being able to ride a bike that's that's a motor skill that would be skill learning this is non-declarative because even though you can describe what a bike look, looks like that's semantic memory right you cannot explain to someone how to ride a bike I mean you can do a little bit why you have to sit in the seat and you hold the handlebars but there is no way you can explain to someone how to maintain their balance you can't do that because that's non-declarative you cannot actually make that explicit right it's implicit memory what do we know about uh, skill learning in the brain well we know a couple of things we know that the basal ganglia are involved these are motor structures right we know that the motor cortex is involved uh, we know that the cerebellum is involved right just to make sure that this is not going to affect each other that's one bit that's one bit and then we have one bit here skill learning right okay okay where are those areas well let me, uh, where's my corpus callosum there we go what have we got in the brain well here you have the insula right insula right and below that if I have to take that out and I bet that's not going to be very easy so I'm just going to take out this uh, brainstem model same part right same part so here we have the insula here we have the insula right with the brain stem attached okay I can take this off there you go here we have basal ganglia in this case the putamen with on the other side ah, the globus pallidus and if you want to have another representation of the basal ganglia that looks like something you may that may look a bit more familiar there you go right the putamen and the head of the caudid nucleus and the tail of the caudid nucleus right basal ganglia this is the picture you may remember from the textbook which looks something like that so the basal ganglia are involved in skill learning but that makes sense because those brain areas that that set of structures is very much involved with motor processes then you have 
motor cortex. Let me just reassemble my cortex here. Motor cortex and cerebellum. Well, motor cortex, that's always a fun one to figure out. So, let me see here. Here we have a brain, front, right, frontal lobe, uh, occipital lobe. Now, if we look, there is always one big sulcus that runs here, okay, the big sulcus that runs from the um, big central fissure here, right? The longitudinal fissure runs between the two hemispheres, longitudinal fissure, and then there is that one sulcus. You always have to search for it a bit. Every brain is a little different, right? It has it, but it's always a little different. Um, so here you have this big sulcus that's called the central sulcus. And the central sulcus divides the frontal lobe and the parietal lobe. Then you have the pre-central gyrus. The gyrus right before the central sulcus, which is this. And that is... Uh, wait, let me make sure I, I point that correctly. Yeah, so that is this, this area, right? That is the motor cortex. And then behind that, the post-central sulcus, the sulcus right behind the central gyrus, right here, that would be the somatosensory cortex that we talked about uh, in, in, uh, for um, uh, specific uh, things that has something to do with, with taste. But most importantly, of course, it represents your entire body. So it provides uh, input from, from touch, right? Sense of touch. So you, that, that goes there. But this motor cortex seems very important for skill learning. Of course, motor skills. Of course you would have a motor cortex that, that provides motor output to your muscles, etc. Of course that's involved. And the final area that's involved is, of course, your cerebellum, which is also known to be involved in motor processes, fine motor processes. So we have all that. What else do we have? Uh, something we haven't really talked about, but if you find it interesting, you should take uh, 358, the cognitive psych. Priming, right? Priming. Uh, this is, you know, the phenomenon where you, uh, you, you, you briefly present something to someone and that influences uh, their further behavior. So, for example, if I show you <clears throat> a bunch of pictures, but every time I flash, let's say, the word hammer, right? Very briefly, you can't even consciously see it. Every time the word hammer, and at the end I ask you, name a tool you're very likely to say hammer. You were not conscious of seeing the word hammer, but every time it was presented to you, you were primed by that word, right? That is a type of memory, right? Implicit memory. You can't explain why you said hammer and not pliers or saw or whatever, but it is there, right? This is a type of memory. Priming is something that we associate with cortex. And that kind of makes sense because that seems you may not be conscious of it, but there does seem to be, uh, you know, some sort of cortical thing that makes you, uh, I guess, um, aware of that prime. You are not consciously aware of having seen it, but it does influence your behavior. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm cool with the, with the cortex part of that. And then the final one is conditioning. And conditioning is not something that we have talked about a whole lot in this class, but you, you remember that from 260, right? Operant conditioning, classical conditioning. And especially the classical conditioning, I would say, right? You're not aware of it happening. Pavlov's dog does not have a choice. It hears the clicking sound and later, say, a bell, and it starts to drool. It does not think, oh, a bell, well, uh... It's Monday, let's drool. That's not how this works, right? It's, it, classical conditioning is done to you. And the dog, of course, cannot explain what has happened, but you can do this with people too. You can make people fear in the lab certain stimuli or certain colors by giving them a little shock every time they see that stimulus of that color. And they may not even be fully aware of why they start to show a fear response, for example, in their skin conductance, every time they see that specific stimulus or that specific color, right? And which uh, brain area do we associate with this? Also, the cerebellum. Okay, well, we've already seen the cerebellum, right? But there you go. A nice cerebellum.
right and on the inside. There we go, cerebellum. So we got that. Now we have all these kinds of memories. So we've had, we have explicit and implicit, we have episodic and semantic, we have skill learning, priming and conditioning. I think the question was, if you have an implicit memory, let's say skill learning, and you have semantic memory, a fact, are these, are these physiologically different? Are they in your brain? Are they different? Are these different processes? Well, we haven't really talked yet about real processes underlying memories and learning because we haven't yet entered the minefield that is long-term potentiation, but we will next time, trust me. And that's going to be great fun, because it's very interesting, it's just a little, little complicated. So, you know, though, how your brain works, because we've talked about this. So, you know about the processes that you have. You have action potentials. And what we haven't talked about, that's the long-term potentiation part, but we'll do that next time is what exactly changes when you learn something. Synapses can be strengthened or, in the case of long-term depression, made weaker. And that, I think, is a process that underlies all of our learning and, and as a result also all of our memories. I don't think that it is fair to say skill learning is, in your brain, a completely different thing from semantic memory, because your brain only has so many processes. Again, there's action potentials, firing rate goes up and down, and there is long-term potentiation or depression, but, but, but that's pretty much it. You make a synapse stronger or weaker, but what else can your brain do, right? So, I wouldn't necessarily say they are completely different processes, but they are mediated by different brain areas. That's, I think, what sets them apart more than the absolute nitty-gritty molecular processes. I don't know if that was really the question you were asking. I think it was, but if not, then let me know and we'll get into uh, the other stuff. That's how I would look at this. Not a completely different process, but different brain areas. And that's pretty much it. I hope that made things a bit clearer.